Hello everyone and welcome on to today's call. Tony Rastel here from Social Hire and delighted today that we have Helene Lafitte who's going to be talking to us about procurement and how procurement can create value uh, when buying consulting services. So I know we have on the call uh, both buyers of consulting services and some of you that also sell consulting services. So a, a great mix of participants today. Please do use that question box to fire questions through during the session. Uh, but Helen, for now, uh, thank you very much for making the time to do this today, and over to you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you and welcome to everyone. I'm very glad to see um, you know, uh, that there are uh, so many people coming to, to that webinar. Um, I wanted to, maybe before we get into the, uh, the um, you know, the the core of the of the of the subject, which is how to uh, procurement create create value when buying consulting services. I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit so people know me. Some of them are already connected with me, but not everyone. So, um, some again, like Tony said, my name is Elena Lafitte. I'm the CEO of Consulting Quest, and uh, it's a company that I founded in 2014, and we have clients to better use buy and manage consulting services. So uh, today, the way the, the session, the webinar is built, it's, it's going to be roughly an hour, 40 minutes presentation, and then, then we will have time for questions. So don't hesitate, like Tony said, to write the question in the, in, the, in the chat box, because we will pick from there and answer as many questions as we can um, during the webinar, after the webinar. And um, there's another thing that I wanted to say, it's about um, you know, where the content for that webinar comes from. Uh, first is our experience working with um, clients all over the globe over the last seven years. The second source is the book, you know, the materials and research that we did for the book that we published last year. It's on the, it's on the, on the slide right now. It's called Smart Consulting Sourcing, and it's available on Amazon. Uh, and the last thing is that we, we have led a series of interviews. Uh, we, we are now at almost 30 interviews uh, from uh, procurement and strategy leaders. And we asked all uh, many questions about procurement value and why do they work with consultants? How, uh, uh, how do they handle that in their company? And this, uh, these are these insights that I'm using in that, in that webinar. And so I'd like to thank all those leaders. I know that some of them are here today. I would like to thank them for their time and their insights because it was extremely valuable. And now I'm, I'm sharing back with the community. And I hope that you'll, uh, that's going to be a very valuable to you too. So that's you know, kind of the, the where it comes from. Uh, maybe now we can start with um, the core content of that webinar. And um, so, or, or, or Tony, do you think we should wait a couple of minutes or, or to get we started? No, please uh, press on. We've got it recording for everyone. So if anyone joins late, then uh, they won't miss out. OK, so let's go. So um, you know, it's, tough. it's a tough time to be in charge. And um, the pressure on OPEX is always increasing. And um, you know, executives need to always deliver more with less. And now value creation is the new black, right? And, but what is value for a consulting project? And, and are procurement and uh, business leaders talking the same language? Are we talking about savings? Is it cost avoidance? Or is it the impact of the project on the business? And are there better ways to maximize that value? So the short answer is yes. And you know, since I founded my company consulting quite seven years ago, we've sourced hundreds our consultants and we redefine best in class methodologies in that consulting space, um, consulting sourcing space. And every time we work with a client, we help them save between 20 to 40 percent of the consulting expenses. So, if you want to understand what procurement can bring to the table, or if you wonder how to create more value with less budget and be recognized by your stakeholders, then that's that's the right place. Okay, so today, um, today we will start with what executives are using consulting services, and progressively we will dive into the how. So we will look at the value that consultants bring to the clients, um, the role and responsibilities of the various stakeholders involved, and then we will review 
potential practical solutions to create more value uh, for, for your business. And, uh, and we, of course, we'll finish with a, um, with a Q&A. So I promise you that at the end of this presentation, you walk away with a good understanding of what is value in consulting and a set of action that you can start implementing in your organization tomorrow. So let's get started. So the first thing that I want you to talk about is when are executives using consulting services? So there are many reasons why you know, companies work with consultants. It can be about entering a new market. So it can be a new industry. It can be a new territory. And they're, you know, having the technical expertise of a consultant who has experience in that industry can be interesting because, indeed, since it's a new market, you may not have that expertise in-house. Then another reason can be that uh, you're hitting a wall in terms of revenues or you have a more powerful competitor coming in and then you need to do something in order to regain some market shares or, or increase your sales and profitability. Um, there's some also sometimes that when you want to um, acquire a new com a competitor in our technology, it can be interesting to have a, a consultant that helps you identify what are the potentials and screen the market for you and identify potential targets. And um, you might also want to improve your project quality. And here is just you kind know, of breaking down your process, identifying potential for improvement, and then implementing those improvements. Reduce costs. I mean, procurement people are very aware of that. I know cost reduction projects, cost cutting. It can be also about you know optimizing the, the tailspin, implementing lean management, etc. And then it can also be about developing the organization, retaining talents, um, and all of this. For all of this subject, you might want to work with an external consultant. So that's kind of the type of projects where you need, you, you'd like to want, work with them. But what do they bring exactly? So how do they help? So we, we saw that, oh, shoot. We saw that they bring, um, they bring technical expertise, indeed. But that's not the only thing that they bring to the table. Another thing that they can bring is an independent perspective. And you know, that it's really hard when you're in your day-to-day -day operations to kind of um, have take a step back and look and, and look at the big picture, right? And um, and also see from and um, see what other industries, other companies do in the in the same situation. It's really hard to do that when you're in into your your day-to-day -day operations. That's also another, another thing that they can bring is that they can be a temporary extra workforce. Let me give you an example. For instance, you have a project that you have to, to launch, uh, but all your teams are occupied on um, very important projects as well. You don't need that, um, that, that, those skills for long term. You just need them for that specific project. Then you can work with consultants. It doesn't mean that you couldn't do that internally. But it's, it's convenient to work with, with, with consultants. Uh, another um, thing that they can bring also is a problem solving approach. So I'm not saying that they are the only ones to know how to, uh, to, to do problem solving, but that's definitely part of the skill set. And, and, uh, and that can bring that a very, very fast paced um, you know, um, problem solving. Then coaching, because it's also about helping you um, transferring knowledge, that's also what they can bring. And finally, of course, analytical skills. We all know about, you know, in particular, uh, before the, 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 the rise of the, of the data, the big data, they were very well known for analytical skills and they still have those skills in class as well. So what do we need to know as procurement when, when we help them identify potential consultants. The first thing is that the maturity of your organization, of the function even that is sourcing, and even the team composition of that function will change when and how executive works with consultants. So I will give you an example like of two different strategy groups. One is in an automotive supplier and um, 
four or five years ago, they, they built a new group that is made of former strategy consultants. And then you have, you know, an electronics manufacturer who has a strategic group as well, but they're using that group to um, train their high potential profiles and give them some understanding of what, stra what strategy is. And all the people that are in that group, they're coming from, you know, everywhere in the company. They can be from supply chain, HR, a little bit everywhere, finance. And so you see that even though those two groups may have overall the same projects to lead, obviously, the degree in which they use consultants is quite different. The one from the automotive suppliers, they have worked on strategy projects before, they have the approach, they know they have the skill set. So they know how to lead a strategy project and they will probably need consultants on very specific parts of the, of the, of the project. And in particular, for instance, the market uh, update or market scan scanning our market entry project, for instance, uh, while on the other side, they will need a much larger scope for the project. So that's what I call the maturity. And you see that even though the project overall is the same, the need for consultants will be very different. Another element is the visibility. When a project is done at, is visible at board level or C level, you won't use the same consulting firm than when it's a very operational project. And it's not a problem of competence of the consultants. It's really a problem of, you know, branding and credibility, right? A third element is the relationship. So that's something that we need to understand and take into account is that consulting is about trust and credibility. And therefore, the consulting, the project sponsor, the, the person who's launching the project has, needs to have a very good relationship with the partners that will deliver. That's how things will, you know, um, work. And that's how the project will be a success. So when you're sourcing, you need, and you want to, you know, you know move the lines and bring in new, new players, you need to add the seat to your list of criteria, because that's also how you choose a consultant. And last part is that sometimes the need of the, of the executive goes beyond the company's interest. What I mean by that is sometimes they work with consultants to increase their influence and manage their career in the company. And that's also something that we need to take into account and that's why it's so hard sometimes to get them to consider another consulting firm. So that's kind of the thing that we need to know about, you know, how, what, when um, executives work with consultants. But I haven't answered the question about the value yet. So that's where we're going to talk about what value the consultants bring to their clients. But I do types of value. Um, one is technical. So the technical value is about, you know, expertise, you know, in-depth expertise. And it can be, for instance, um, supply chain expert that has done that for 25 years in um, a set of industries. That's kind of technical value that they can bring you in that specific field. And then there's another type of value, which is the political value. So I think I'm not going to, you know, you're not going to discover today that there are political um, plays in your company. <laughs> Even if it's a very small one, there are always, you know, some poli political, some politics involved. But the consultants, they can help smooth the process. They can help facilitate measures. And so most of the project will, you know, mix those two values, right? So I'm going to dive into your first the technical value and give you examples of what that could be. So we, I said that that was about in-depth expertise. And, and most operational projects, that will be creating technical value for your business. So for instance, it can be provide outside knowledge. So that's you know, benchmark, uh, methodology, tools, processes, um, and, but also experience on what works and what doesn't work. 
right? That's that's something that they can bring you. Also, identifying uh, a problem and its solution, and identify you know um, gathering the information and giving it to the executive so they can make an informed decision. That's also you know technical value. Build an actionable plan, generate the roadmap, and then execute the road, help execute the roadmap. All of this falls into the technical value category. So this is this is probably the, the easier one to understand, right? While the political value is a little bit more complicated. First, it can be um, providing, helping um, make decisions. Not that the, the messages were not made already, but finding ways to explain, to justify a decision. And sometimes it can be, be the scapegoat. It's not me. It's that company, page 135. That's what they did. That's not me, right? We have all been in that situation. The um, second element could be, um, you know, facilitating the convergence between the stakeholders or the top leadership on a given issue. Also, when you work with a consultant and you use him as a sounding board, a trusted advisor, this is also political value. And finally, when you want to enforce unpopular changes, for instance, a cost cutting project, then it can the, the, the consultant can bring you also political value. So that's kind of the two. And again, a project can be a mix of the two. It's not one or the other. So how do you measure value? It's a very difficult question, and uh, there's no easy answer. Let's say that if you want to measure value, you have to understand that there are different types of values. The first one is the easiest one, is the visible one of the direct value. It's, for instance, savings. It's um, um, when, you, uh, when you increase your top line, when you, um, you improve your EBITDA, this is direct value. You can measure it. It's easy. It's direct, right? Then there's longer term value, long term value. Here, you are going to impact more the valuation of the company, if you will. It's, it can be a very large strategic project where you make very important decisions on the 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 um the direction that you want to take for your company. This is longer term value. That's where you're going. It's it's much more, more difficult to to measure and to identify which part of that value is directly linked to your project. But that doesn't mean that it's not linked to it. And the last one is cost avoidance. And here it's more when you hire a consultant to, to put everybody back on tracks, right? And uh, so you just go back to normal, and, and the money you saved by getting back on tracks, that money that you're not spending on, on inefficiencies, for instance, they discuss about it. And again, it's not easy to measure. Um, but that's, that's, um, that's also the value that you know consultant can bring you. So what do we need to know as the comment when it comes to value? If you listen closely to what I said before, I never mentioned price, right? I talked about value and, our, and it's also impact. And hopefully that impact is higher than the cost of the project. But the focus is really on the value. And to secure that value, the fourth thing that you can do, one is to work with the right consultants in expertise, and in fit, I mentioned the human component of you know, the, the relationship with the consultants. That's a very important part. The second thing that you can do is secure deliverables and impact. So that's your, once a project is launched, you have to make sure that the project delivers the impact that you're looking for, including the buying. Again, the human component. And here we're touching more on change management, making sure that the, the actions that you will decide will be accepted by your teams. This is how you make sure that your project is a success. A fourth thing that procurement can bring to the table is sourcing fast. This one of the things that probably has a lot of value is being able to source right and fast. And finally, you know, keep the cost under control and in the budget that was, um, that was uh, um, agreed on for that for that specific project. So that's how procurement can help on, you know, 
capturing that value. So now, now that we have you know, seen at a very high level when executives um, need consultants and what, what value um, the consultant can bring them, I wanted to touch upon you know, the sourcing process and see how it should be, uh, it should happen. So that's a question that I asked to, to the, you know, the, uh, the different uh, procurement leaders that I interviewed is that when should procurement be involved in the sourcing process? And so the question were all over the place. And the, um, it's to write the contract, it's uh, when there's an issue, it's to negotiate the price. Um, the first one is a little bit of provocative, like never, I don't, we don't want to um, uh, work on those projects. The truth is that none of those answers are right. The right answer is at the very beginning. And I know, I know that a lot of procurement executives would like that to happen and it doesn't, but this is how it should be. Procurement should be involved at the very beginning of the process when the needs are not completely articulated yet. There's an idea, there's a need, and then what do we do with that? So the sourcing process has like three phases. One is how you um, define the, the scope and the budget. So it's what do I need and how much am I ready to invest in that need? The second part is identifying and briefing the potential providers. So it's looking at the market or your list of preferred providers and look at what consulting firms could be a great fit and what do I need to give them so they can submit a good proposal. Because the, the goal here is to have enough solid proposal so that you can make an informed choice. And the last part, of the process is to review the proposal and make a decision. You have those proposals, which one best fit my needs on the content, the fit, the team composition, and the price. And in the three phases, you will find um, the business lines with, where, where you have the project sponsors who own the budget, the project manager, who will be the one to manage um, the daily life of the projects, and the main stakeholders, the other division function that are involved in the project. And of course, you will find procurement. So when you identify the scope and the budget, the business lines, they come with their needs. They have to articulate the problem they're trying to solve and they have to explain the expected outcome. And procurement is here to challenge, reformulate, and formalize the elements into an RFP that the business line will validate. When you are at the shortlist and briefing phase, again, the business line are the ones who define the criteria and the priorities on, uh, on what type of consulting firm they're looking for. And then procurement will go and look at the list of suppliers and the market to identify which providers could be a great fit and check eligibility of those providers. Business line decides on the short list, and then they will share the objective with those potential consultants. They will share the RFP and brief them, explain what they're looking for so they can remit a proposal. And finally, you review the proposal, so the business line can look at, at it from a business standpoint. So they will challenge the expertise and the approach. That's the how the, the work will be done, right? And then procurement will look at it from a procurement standpoint. They will look at the team composition and the price. And then negotiate with the consultants, so the business line can make the final decision. So what we need to know here is that procurement in when you're buying consulting, fears, consulting services, it's a part of that bring processes, methods, and tools, and that helps mitigate the risk. And um, that's collaboration that really you know, makes the difference. 
because the, the most value is captured when you collaborate closely with the business life. I'm not saying that you know, um, sourcing alone as a, as a business leader is non-valuable, and it's indeed it's, it's use, usually faster, there are less interfaces, but the value you can, that procurement can bring you is also very important, and they can also open your eyes to uh, new potential providers, and, and, and mitigate the risk, that's also a very important point. So there's, there's value to work closely with uh, the business science for, 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 for uh, procurement and for, there's value for procurement to work with the business science as well, at both sides. So we saw that in the sourcing process, which is probably the first place where you can create more value, Collaboration is where you get most value, right? It's it's working together and, and giving some structure to their process, challenging the business line to make sure that they buy what they need and only what they need, uh, getting them to uh, consider new suppliers. That's how you bring value. But this you can bring value beyond that sourcing process. So at Consulting Quest, this is how we look at the problem. When, when a company comes to us and wants to know if they can capture more value when they're sourcing consultants. And we look at the maturity of their capability on different dimensions. The first dimension is strategy, governance, and organization. So it's how decisions are made and who's involved and how consulting is supporting the strategy. Then we look at the sourcing process. It's a little bit what I said in the previous part, is that how is the process handled, how the bids organized, how the scoping done, how the contracting is handled, do you send NDA, all of this is all those dimensions that are linked to the sourcing process. The third thing that we look at is category management. We look at the key elements for an efficient category management, and we see if they apply those elements to the consulting category. And finally, uh, we look at the enablers. So enablers can be digital tools, taxonomy, all the elements that make everything else possible. So if we look at um, if we look at the strategy, governance, and organization, the first thing that can be done is implement systematic demand management. So the goal here is to make sure you're only spent on the most strategic project. And it's the, it's the best way to put your expenses under control. The thing is, it requires to have some centralized decision-making process and a strict governance. And therefore, it will work only if you have a strong support from, your, from the top leadership. In the same idea, you have um, you can implement systematic megabyte assessments. So there's a lot of uh, so of course the prerequisite here is that you have some uh, teams that can handle project internally, right? And so here, um, what is interesting is that you can leverage your internal resources if you have them, and you can keep confidentiality under control. But and the, and that's a big but. You need to have the resources and the competencies to supervise that outsourcing and to implement strict governance. Because launching a project with consultants without managing the project is doomed to fail. I hear very often uh, you know, clients telling me, oh, this, this project didn't work, the consultant this, the consultant that. And it's sometimes true that you know, the consultant didn't deliver what was expected. But often, it's kind of a mixed responsibilities between the, the consultants and the clients who did not manage, who did not make sure that um, the consultants were in the right condition. So, you know, if you want to work with external consultants, you need to have a project team in place and a strict governance to make sure that, you know, everyone is, is, is uh, delivering what is expected. Another thing that you can do is have a dedicated consulting procurement team. So, of course, you have more control on the projects and a better understanding of the market, but you need critical mass. You need to have enough you know, projects, enough volume in order to justify uh, the, to dedicate uh, a team to that. 
And finally, you need to collaborate. And that's a very good way to identify cross-pollinization and, and to manage uh, change, for instance. Uh, the problem is that uh, it can be slower because you have many interfaces, and then it's not always adapted to small projects. It's not worth your time for small projects. Um, then you have the sourcing process where you can put in place systematic um, resistance checking. And um, so it's interesting to me to get the risk and understand finally what the consultants are good at. Uh, but the problem is that it can slow down the process and require some extra work. Another thing that you can do is to implement frame contracts. So this is kind of very common. You have uh, a list of referred providers, you pre-negotiate terms and conditions, including um, end of year discounts. And then it's a much quicker process for your business life. But the problem is that you need to communicate very closely to your stakeholders and anticipate the needs because they need to find in your list of preferred providers the consultant that they want to work with. So you need to make sure that you have the right companies, consulting firms in your panel. You can also work with sophisticated fee structures so what is that? It can be uh, value sharing models, it can be performance based fees, everything in that area and can help you uh, yield more value, but also align your interests with the consulting firms and mitigate the risks. The problem is that it's not always applicable um, because it's hard to define the baseline and the conditions of success. And it's hard to define if the project is the only reasons why you had an increase in that specific area. And it required very clear governance to make sure that you really tracked all the other elements in, in the success. And finally, you have the open sourcing policy. So here the idea is to always have the best band for the job. And it means always, you know, we, we, I said before that you have to work with the right partner in, in expertise and fit. That's what it is about. But the problem is that first, um, if you have a list of preferred providers and a very strict qualification process that takes like six weeks to qualify a, consul a consultant, that's going to be very hard to source, um, you know, the, the best consultant for a project. And then you need to know the market very, very well in order to identify the ones that could be a great fit. So that's, you know, that's what is kind of the downside of that. But apart from that, that's the, how you get to the right partner for your project. Then you have all the category management elements. Um, there's spend management, of course, you, you keep your spend under control. Of course, it requires some centralization and that can decrease the freedom from the business lines. You have the list of preferred providers. We, we talked about that several times. It has to be anticipated, but it can speed the process and help build intimacy with the suppliers. Uh, you can also um, implement performance assessments um, with your suppliers. So it's a very good way to manage your panel and make sure that you always work with the best ones on the right capabilities, but it requires consistency. And then you have the improvement plans. Again, if you have enough volume, enough projects on a given capability, then you can start building relationship with your preferred supplier and build improvement plans to make sure that it only gets better. And the last part is the enablers. So the first part is the taxonomy. I, I think that's a very important one. At the very beginning of the webinar, I mentioned that the business leaders and the procurement leaders need to speak the same language. And you, you know, the taxonomy, this is exactly what it is about. Defining what is the taxonomy, what are the different capabilities, the different types of services that, that you need for your company. It's very important to define that and to share with, with, the, uh, with your internal stakeholders because it brings clarity and consistency 
and it will increase collaboration. But it has to be updated on a regular basis and it has to be defined from a client perspective. Because if you use the jargon that some consultants use, this is not going to be helpful. People will look at it and they will not understand. So we, you really need to do something that is very easy to understand and accurate and with the right granularity. And the other enablers that you can use here are um, you know, automated workflows. So that gives you an overview of the project and you make sure that the, you know, the, um, the internal processes are compliant and that everybody res respects the policies, but you can rigidify the process. So we need to really set up that very right. You can also put in place an automated dashboard to give you, you know, an overview of the consulting category. Um, but it requires a, a taxonomy very clear. So that's, you know, goes back to the first element. And finally, uh, we talk a lot about that, how you can leverage the expert networks and consulting marketplaces. You can have access to high-level expertise for short-term needs. It can bring you flexibility and preparedness, but you have to understand what they're good for. I mean, it's good for body shopping. It's good for punctual expertise needs, but sometimes it's hard to measure the performance and identify in advance if that, that you know, particular consultant or, or expert will be good for, for your need. So these are the different elements that um, that you can implement or you can you know start with. So one thing that you need to know is that I gave you examples and solutions. Of course, you don't need to implement all of them, and you don't need to launch a company-wide transformation to get started. The 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 first step is probably to understand what what is the value that you could that you could capture. And probably, and, and so you, you need to define your baseline. It's, it means that you need to understand how much you're spending, on what, and who is spending. You need to understand how decisions are, take, are made from the inception to the selection of the providers. And then you need to understand what benefits you're getting for your projects and your providers. Or in other words, um, what what impact did your project have? Were we satisfied with the performance of your of your providers? And once you've done that, then you can start you know rake the quick gains. So that can be um, you know clean up your panel um, and and your practices and your decision making process, improve your sourcing process, or improve your demand management system. All of this can be done very fast if you do you know an analysis of your of of your uh, from a project on, in a period of one year, for instance, and then you can you know, gather a lot of information and start changing things that will generate value. And if you are already there and you have a you know, more mature system, you can go onto our website, consultingquest.com slash complex, and we have a self-assessment if you have a few questions, and then I will give you a few, a few ideas to um, improve your, improve your you know, capture more value from, from your consulting spend. Right, that's it, and uh, um, that's how we, 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 uh, you can create more value when you're buying consulting services. Again, all of this is very generic. It's, it really depends on your maturity, on your uh, organization, and, uh, and, uh, and how far you want to go, but this is kind of a good, you know, a good overview of what solution you, you could implement. That's been terrific, Helen. Thank you ever so much. Um, if people would like to find out more about you or, or get in touch to ask further the questions, uh, do you want to direct them to the website, or, or how should they go about doing that? So they can go. They can contact me on LinkedIn, um, or they can send me an email. Uh, so my name is, uh, is, there's always people that are making mistakes in that, so they can contact me at elaine.lafitte at consultingquest.com and just ask me the question, and I will be very happy to uh, you know, book a one-on-one -on -one session and discuss about that, whatever they want to talk about. Fantastic, thank you. A uh, couple of questions, if I may. Um, what uh, percentage of companies do you think 
you talked about uh, getting maximum value from consulting services. Uh, what, what percentage of companies do you think have really mastered getting that maximum value from the, the services they procure? <laughs> that's, that's a tough one. Um, I don't have an exact percentage, but what I can tell you is that um, a few of, uh, two years ago, we did um, an, a maturity assessment uh, with with uh, roughly um, you know eighty companies, all mostly on the on the large size, right? Like between one billion revenues and over, and they. On a scale to one to five, the average was around 2.5 for uh, five being very advanced, um, you know, best in class companies and one being basic, right? And they were somewhere between two and three. And there are very, very few ones from, from on that, on that uh, survey that ended up at four and five. So I'd say very few. Uh, of course, this is imperfect because a very small company doesn't need to do to be at five <laughs> because a lot of the solutions that we have in best-in-class consulting sourcing are um, as, as a prerequisite to have enough volume, right? So it doesn't apply to smaller companies, but I think that we have probably, if I had to give a number, you know, I'd say that's probably between 10 to 15 percent that are decent, um, you know, consulting sourcing capability. Mm. A lot of scope for improvement, it sounds like. <laughs> um, there's a question about uh, online auctions. What's your view about online auctions uh, regarding fee rates by grade? Uh, do, you, do you have any experience with them? Do you think they really work? Um, uh, <laughs> I, I have never done that. I don't think it's very applicable to consulting. And the reason is that um, we, we didn't mention that um, during, during the webinar, but what makes consulting very difficult is that when you're negotiating a consulting agreement, you're not only negotiating rates and, and price. It's, it's kind of a mix between the the um the scope of the project the timeline um the team composition and uh and of course the the, the rates and and therefore you know focusing only on the price is is not really right and so however if you're in a project that is very simple that is extremely, uh, you know, um, where, where the, the, the consulting expertise is a commodity, then maybe it would work. But again, you you have nothing about the fit with the consultants. So if I had to say, do you think it's a good thing? I'd say not for consulting now. I don't think that that works. Okay. I don't think it brings the value that we're looking for. And how do you feel about the application of incentives in dealing with the performance management of consultants? Um, do you mean uh, adding incentive for for um, the the consultants in the in the contract when they perform well? Uh, I'm just reading out the question as it's come through. So let's, which is, that. So let's uh, say two things. Yes, uh, the, the answer comes through. Yes, yes, that is the question. Okay, right. So I think it's very interesting. I think it's a very interesting um, way to, to, to work with consultants because uh, you can align their interests with yours and make sure that deliver, delivering fast and, and better is also has value for them directly beyond the my, my client is happy that will also share the value with you. Uh, the, 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 um, the downside to that is that when you work with, you know, performance-based um, bonuses, for instance, is that if you want to work only on performance-based fees, then hundreds of percent of the risk is with the consultants. And um, if, if usually the consulting firm that accept that type of fees are smaller, and therefore for them it's a huge risk, and I don't think it's either relevant or fair to work like that. However, 
uh, if you have a mix of, you know, a flat fees and performance-based bonus, that, come, that can become very interesting. There is, we know, there are limitations to working with per per percentage-based or performance-based um, fees. And the, the limits are that you need to define where you start and where you end up. And you need to make sure that that measure includes only the impact of the consulting firm and the project. And that's where it becomes harder, right? Because if it's a, a cost, you know, cost um, optimization project, for instance, then then it's easier because you you decide you get you 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 give the consulting firm. A, a portfolio of contracts and you and they renegotiate or give you um, tips to renegotiate and then you can measure how much saving you made at the end of the period. You'll see, oh, this is easy. But the problem is that, and I have a, a my kind of very practical example on that. I worked on a, a tail spend optimization a few years ago. And um, so we, we had we had negotiated with a consulting firm a performance-based bonus that was based on the percentage of savings that were made. But between the time of when we 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 uh, acted on on the, the 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 prices, the terms and condition, and the moment when the project started, the market for raw materials, you know, just collapsed, and the price for raw materials went down significantly. So the baseline that we had agreed on on the consulting agreement on the prices of the portfolio of raw materials had decreased already without any impact from the consulting firm. So this is kind of a, this is hard to do that. That's why I'm saying when you do that, you have to have very clear KPIs and then you have to uh, always agree with the consultant at, uh, at the different points, agree on the impact and, and what is included in the baseline or not. Understood. And uh, a couple of other questions that have come through, Ellen. Um, is there anything wrong uh, with working predominantly with large consulting firms? Or I guess put that another way, is, are there reasons you would recommend that companies should also consider smaller firms? Um, yeah, I think that I, I discussed about working only with the best mind for the job, right? And I think that there is, it's wrong to work only with big ones, and it's probably wrong to work only with one small one, very small ones. Uh, it's right to, to work with the ones that are the right skills and um, for, your, for your need and can bring you the right value. So when you have a very large scale transformation and you need kind of uh, to roll out the same thing everywhere in the, in the world, you need a very large footprint uh, on the side of the consulting firm, then you will turn to large consulting firms, obviously. And when you need some political value and you need the stamp of a big firm, it's really, there's, there's really no way around. And on the other hand, when you're working on, for instance, a market entry strategy and you need a very deep expertise in, let's say, the, uh, I don't know, the, the uh, chemical industry in uh, in oil and gas um, industry in Texas, maybe the last consulting firm is not the right choice. And working with a small, very focused strategy firms that has that expertise in oil and gas in the U.S. and in Texas is the right choice. So I think this it's all about it's need driven, if you will. It's always what's the need, and then. What are the different consulting firms that you can send any? Being bigger or small actually is not really relevant. It's about do they feed the needs and do they answer, do they, will they bring the value um, I need? Thank you. And are you seeing any trends in terms of uh, how many consulting firms companies are inviting to, to bid for work, to put forward a proposal? So, uh, through the discussions I had with the different um, procurement leaders, 
I I heard that a lot of them were trying to expand their panel to uh to to what they call tier two and tier three consulting firms, which means that they're really trying to um open opportunities to smaller firms or more expert firms, which I think is is very interesting. Uh, the problem that they're facing is sometimes the reluctance of their business leaders that with a given person again they, that's that you know kind of um preferred special relationship that they have with one firm or the other actually it's not one firm it's one person that moves from one firm to the next uh that's that and um and then there's there's also and in particular in france for instance it's very very uh it's an obstacle for smaller firms it's the qualification process that it's extremely complicated, extremely uh, time-consuming and long, and it's it's for, it's sometimes not even worth the time for smaller firms. So this kind of the two the obstacles. But I I hear the trend that those companies are trying to really open their panel to smaller firms or, or to firms that have you know specific expertise on a given su subject. Yeah. Excellent. And one uh, final question, and then we'll wrap things up. Uh, do you have any recommendations around uh, splitting up the deliverables of a consulting project and somehow connecting those deliverables to payments? So, so tying uh, results to uh, to payment. Uh, that that's extremely that's complicated. Um, when you when you work as a consultant. Um, it's 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 rare that your deliverables are, are completely sequential. Mm. That's possible when when once you're done with the deliverable, then you start the next one, then you start the next one. And it's it's not it's not often the case. Very often you work in parallel on two different subjects, and then you you have kind of a bunch of deliverable uh, coming uh, at the same time. So it can work, um, but it, it's it's. It's kind of hard to implement. The I usually to I usually recommend to my client to have a schedule for payment that is more based on the time and uh, that then then the deliver. However, however, it can also kind of a proxy can be the team composition. Uh, what I mean by that is that when you have a lot of persons on the team, means that you're doing the bulk of the work. When you have less persons, it means that you have less work to do, right? The workload is lower. So that can be a good proxy to make sure that you still keep some leverage <laughs> at the end of the project. You get some leverage and, and you, you, you can still, uh, you know, um, continue to put pressure on the consultant so they deliver until the very end. But I'm not sure that on the delivery side, it's that easy. Okay. Um, Helen, thank you ever so much for your time. It's been really interesting. Some great questions come through. Uh, we've got further sessions coming up uh, early next year. So all, all those of you who've registered, you'll get through uh, the details of those next calls as well. And we'll be great to see you on those in, in due course. Uh, but for now, thank you for your time. Helen, thank you ever so much for all your insights. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now.